Hello all! Welcome back to the Knowledge Tower, where we investigate the science behind the Bionicle legend. Back in part two of the Ignition Trilogy in 2007, Bionicle fans were introduced to the dark and deadly underwater world of Mari Nui. That sunken Matoran settlement was surrounded by the mutagenic waters of the sea and hounded by the villainous Baraki. Protected from these dangers only by the fragile air bubbles harvested from the nearby airweed fields. Being air breathers themselves, the Matoran needed to constantly replenish these air bubbles around the buildings of Mari Nui to keep it habitable, and they even found a way to keep air bubbles around their own bodies to allow breathing beyond the confines of Mari Nui itself, although this was somewhat time limited due to the smaller nature of these personal air bubbles. It is these personalised air bubbles that we will be concentrating on in this edition of the Knowledge Tower, alongside the surprising real-world science that can explain how they work. For years, I had always written these off as pure science fiction. As anyone who has ever seen a bubble underwater can tell you, they don't stick around in the depths. They rise to the surface, and quite rapidly too. This is all down to the principle of buoyancy. In any fluid, pressure increases with depth as a result of the weight under gravity of the fluid above. The deeper you go, the more of the fluid is above you, and thus the pressure increases. Because of this, any object submerged within a fluid feels a greater pressure at the bottom of the object than it does at the top, as the bottom of the object is deeper within the fluid. This difference in pressure results in a net upward force on the object, which we call buoyancy. The magnitude of this force is determined by the Archimedes Principle, worked out by Archimedes of Syracuse all the way back in 246 BCE. The principle states that any object, totally or partially immersed in a fluid or liquid, is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by that object. If this force is less than the weight of the object, then it is not enough to overcome the pull of gravity, and the object sinks. Meanwhile, if it is larger than the weight of the object, then the buoyant force will cause it to rise to the surface. It is this reason why air bubbles rise in water. A given volume of air held underwater is far less dense than the same volume of water that it displaces, and therefore weighs far less, resulting in a large enough buoyant force to overcome gravity and cause the air to shoot to the surface. This, of course, can be counteracted by placing an impermeable barrier between the air and the surface to hold it in place, something that we see that the Matoran of Mari Nui have done in order to keep their larger air bubbles secured around the buildings of the city. So, that's fine for Mari Nui, but then how do the personalised air bubbles work? The Matorans certainly don't carry around little umbrellas to keep above their heads to hold down the air in the depths with them. Plus, there is the fact that a large enough air bubble to keep them completely dry and away from the mutagenic effects of the black water may well experience enough of a buoyant force to not only overcome its own weight, but that of the Matoran as well, shooting them and their air umbrellas off towards the surface at a rapid pace. That's why old-school diving bells had to be so heavy in order to sink whilst keeping the air inside, and why this, admittedly very fun, sequence from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies wouldn't actually work if Will and Jack tried this stunt for real. When I originally had the idea for this video, that was going to be the main theme, using buoyancy to show that the personalised air bubbles of the Mari Nui Matoran simply wouldn't work in the real world. But then a random article I happened upon in a science magazine showed me that nature really does have endless ways to surprise you. Introducing a very cool lizard, the Anolis aquatus, commonly known as the water anole. This small, semi-aquatic lizard, native to southwestern Costa Rica and far southwestern Panama, has some very interesting adaptations to spending extended periods underwater, possibly as an adaptation to help them avoid predators. The first of these adaptations is that their skin is very hydrophobic, meaning that it repels water. It does this via nanoscale structures on its own skin that take advantage of the surface tension and cohesion of water molecules to trap a layer of air on its skin. Cohesion describes the attraction of molecules for other molecules of the same type, with water having strong cohesion due to the way water molecules form strong hydrogen bonds with one another. The opposite of cohesion is adhesion, which describes the tendency of molecules to be attracted to other molecules of a different type. 
which water does under certain circumstances. Glass, for example, is a substance where water is able to form stronger bonds with its molecules than with other water molecules. So the water adheres to the glass rather than cohering with itself. This is why water tends to spread out more on glass rather than forming droplets. Surface tension, meanwhile, describes the tendency of a liquid surface to resist rupture when placed under stress or tension. Water molecules at the surface of a pool or droplet cohere and form hydrogen bonds with the droplets around them. However, unlike deeper in the water, they have fewer molecules around them at the surface as they are surrounded by air on one side, and so they form stronger bonds with the neighbouring molecules that are nearby. The upshot of this for our little lizard is that when water encounters the nanoscale ridges it has on its skin, like say when it dives into a river, so little of the water's surface is in contact with the ridges themselves that the cohesive forces outweigh the adhesive ones. This stops the water from filling the gaps between the ridges and traps whatever air was within them between the water and the lizard's skin, effectively forming a bubble around its body. This air, thanks to being trapped within the ridges and only having water on one side, has such a small buoyant force applied to it that the surface tension of the water can easily overcome it, stopping the bubble from floating away from the lizard. Now that the water anole has this trapped layer of air around its body, its second adaptation can kick in. The anole exhales air from its lungs whilst under the water, expanding the trapped air layer and forming a larger area of the air bubble around its snout, like this. The anole then re-breathes this bubble of air, taking a little more of the oxygen out of the bubble with each breath. But why does it re-breathe the same bubble of air rather than just holding its breath instead? The current leading theory on this is that the bubble allows the anole to both shed carbon dioxide that is building up within its system and to extract a little extra oxygen from the water itself. As carbon dioxide builds up within the bubble with each exhalation, the difference in the level of carbon dioxide in the bubble versus the surrounding water increases. When a concentration of a gas is higher on one side of the water-air interface than it is on the other, that gas passes from the area of high concentration to low in a process called diffusion. The same thing happens the other way with oxygen. As oxygen levels in the bubble decrease, then dissolved oxygen from the water diffuses into the bubble to try and restore the balance, giving a little bit more in the bubble for the anole to breathe and letting it stay underwater just a little bit longer. This diffusion process is not fast enough to keep up with the needs of the anole, however, so there is a time limit on how long the lizard can stay underwater using this method. The anole keeps very still and may even slow down its metabolism in order to reduce its need for oxygen, but after around 15 minutes it needs to resurface for fresh air. Just like with the water anole, I think the personalised air bubbles of the Mari Nui Matoran work in this way. When they were initially transformed by the pit mutagen, their bodies gained hydrophobic properties that allowed them to maintain a trapped layer of air around themselves. Then, through a mixture of their own exhalations, oxygen diffusion and the bubbles accidentally released from the airweed during Mari Nui's sinking, they were able to survive long enough to set up the barriers for the bigger air bubbles around the city. From then on, Whenever they left the safety of the main air bubbles, their hydrophobic nature allowed them to maintain a smaller air bubble around themselves, but one that had a strict time limit based on just how much oxygen their bodies needed with each breath to keep going. The Matoran would even have an advantage over the water anole, as their bubbles would likely be pure oxygen, rather than the only 21% oxygen of the anole's bubbles. The air in Earth's atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, with the remaining 1% being made up of other gases like carbon dioxide and argon. It's this mixture of gases that gets trapped in the anole's air bubble when it goes underwater. The Mari Nui Matoran, however, get their air not directly from Aquamagna's atmosphere, but instead from the airweed that surrounds their city. Airweed, which is described in story as a type of undersea plant native to Aquamagna, most likely produces these bubbles via photosynthesis, using sunlight to break down carbon dioxide dissolved in the water into sugars, with oxygen as a byproduct. This oxygen is what the Matoran harvest from the bubbles in their airweed, meaning that their personal and city bubbles are made up purely of that gas. 
This would have the benefit of making the bubbles last far longer, as they would only have in them what they need, without any other gases diluting the mixture. Oxygen would constantly bleed out of the bubbles due to diffusion like we explored earlier, but this is a slow process, so overall the bubbles would still keep the metaurin alive longer than if they were composed of a normal air mixture. This, combined with physiological differences between metaurin and humans that could mean metaurin might need less oxygen overall to keep them going, could help explain how the personalised air bubbles are able to last as long as they do in the story. While the time limit of the bubbles is an ever-present threat to the Matoran, the amount of things characters like Descartes are able to do with the air supply of just a single bubble suggests that they must last a lot longer than the 15 minutes of the water and all, most likely on the scale of an hour or two, rather than only a few minutes. I also think that the visuals of this type of personalised air bubble are just plain cooler than the simple oval surrounding their bodies that the word bubble would suggest a tight, form-hugging layer that gives the Matoran of Mari Nui a strange sheen to them, with a more traditional bubble shape constantly expanding and contracting around their mouths as they breathe in and out. That image certainly seems cool to me. It's also something you often find when applying real science to sci-fi elements. Often, how something would really look winds up being even cooler than what pure fiction can come up with. And I think that's really neat. But, as good as I think this explanation is for how the personalised air bubbles work, it doesn't explain everything. For example, if the Matoran's bodies really are hydrophobic, then why does the mutagenic water of the pit begin to affect them when the air bubble runs out? If it worked in this way, running out would just mean that the oxygen content of the bubble got low enough that it couldn't sustain the Matoran anymore. Not that the bubble disappears entirely. And come to think of it, why do biomechanical beings like the Matoran even need to breathe anyway? I do have some more theories to answer these questions, but I feel that they deserve a video of their own, so you will just have to wait for part two. Until then, please let me know what you thought of this theory in the comments below, and I will see you again soon for another Bionicle Science investigation here at the Knowledge Tower.